Gary Cohen, welcome to the New School at Commonweal. Thanks, Michael. I'm glad to be with you today. Gary, you and I were somehow present at the beginning of a new stage in a very old movement of people and communities to uh, create a better environment for living and working and raising families and having children. And um, my memory is we met in New York City. Uh, and my, my first memory of meeting you, but you may have a previous one, was at a meeting at the Nathan Cummings Foundation with Charlie Halpern. Now, is that where you remember first meeting? I do. Yeah. yeah. And we met, and um, somehow I just felt a connection with you. You were just back from a long stay in India. Is that right? Yeah, I'd spent a year uh, in yeah. India. Yeah. India before 95. Yeah. And um, you'd been working on toxics in India, right? And and ten years before working on toxics in right. the United States. You had yeah. been part of a very major effort, the National Toxics Coalition, uh, which had done a lot of important work and then had come to an end, and you took a year in India. Is that basically Yeah. That's we basically had, what yeah. happened. During that time, the early years, uh, we had started to organize uh, communities that were all around the country that were living next to toxic dumps and incinerators and other industrial facilities that were polluting them. And one of the, the big victories that happened during that time was the national right to know law was passed so that for the first time, citizens, people in communities got information um, about the the pollution coming out of the stacks in the air, going into the water, being dumped on the land. And so it gave people tools uh, for the first time and information of things they knew intuitively um, that, that their families were being poisoned by toxic chemicals. And you, in fact, were one of the leaders of that effort. I was in that. I was in the middle of that. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. And as with many things, when it came to an end, there were various views on various points of view and that was the time at which you decided to take this sort of i don't know what you want to call it sabbatical spiritual journey but also um you were very involved with bhopal right yeah that's actually how i uh, that was one of the early um early efforts that actually brought me into into this movement um the a union carbide factory exploded one night in Bhopal, India, a pesticide factory, killing thousands of people in one night and injuring a half a million other people as they slept in their beds. And um, at that time, Life magazine was a very popular uh, medium. And uh, over the cover and the pages of, of, of Life magazine, they showed pictures of Bhopal, and it, it, was, it was terrifying. Um, dead people all over the place and people blinded by these poisonous gases and people in this country in the United States said maybe that could happen here and actually the Bhopal disaster was was a, a real a catalytic moment that actually helped us win the right to know law in this country even during a, a Republican administration during Ronald Reagan's presidency um so it was it was a very it was it was the Hiroshima of the chemical industry, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that happened while you were still in the U.S., is that right? Yeah, and I helped to organize the first tour of the Bhopal survivors as they were going to confront Union Carbide at their annual shareholders meeting in Houston. And um, and through they did a tour all across the country, and they visited many of the toxic chemical hotspots and communities around the country and started to build, even then, some of the connective tissue that then led to 
some of the global networks that you know together we created over the years. So lead us through uh, that period where the National Toxic Coalition imploded, or whatever language we want to use. There were very I, we don't have to go into the detail of that at all. But uh, th at that point, the collective effort to organize on behalf of what we now call environmental health and justice was in some disarray. And you are taking that moment, uh, having been central to the National Toxics Coalition, to go over to India. So um, you arrive in India, and what is your intention on arriving in India, Bhopal having happened? Uh, where do you settle, and what is your intention? Um, well, we went, uh, my wife and I went together, Carol, and we went to uh, a hill town in the Himalayas called Missouri, where they have a, a Hindi school, uh, a language school, and we studied Hindi for several months, so I could become a little more facile in the country. Um, and uh, we did that, and then we went to Goa. Um, south of Bombay, and we I came and met my um, good friend and fellow organizer, uh, Sachu Serenge, who, had, who, had, who had, had been organizing in Bhopal. Um, and, and right after the disaster, he had moved there and set up a free clinic for those that were, were contaminated and, and, and hurting. And so we met in Goa, it was at the very same time as this campaign that was emerging and coming to a coming to a head, where um, basically native people in the hills of Goa were opposing a Dupont chemical factory that was going to come up, and it was on their sacred land, and there was a huge campaign there, and so we got pulled in, me from the United States and Satchu from Bhopal talking about the the role of the chemical industry and what it had done in the United States and what it had done in Bhopal and telling the people there that if you let them in, if you let this happen, then, there's, then you'll be living with the legacy of the pollution for decades and decades. Um, and so the, the moment to actually stop them was then. And so there was a, a huge effort uh, that actually led to uh, – women and children blocking the road to the factory site. Um, it, uh, DuPont had, had hired uh, uh, private security people. Um, they opened fire on these, these women and kids. A young man stood in front to try to protect them and was killed. And uh, it was a, a, a flashpoint. Um, and so what happened then is that um, the uh, the whole state of Goa was in a was in a lockdown, um, a, a kind of a by the citizens, you know, um, kind of a a national strike in that state, and um, they brought this kid in this open van with his dad sitting at his head and all flowers around this, and they brought him like a like a hero all through these villages up to. Uh, up to this site where this factory was. And the organizers who had linked up with the, the, the chemical union had said to the, to the company, DuPont said, if you don't get your people out of that site by the time that this funeral procession gets there, you can't answer for what will happen. And so they helped those security people leave in the middle of the night and the factory site was abandoned. And this funeral pyre with thousands of people standing there as this this boy was cremated um, happened. Um, and it was a very powerful moment where people had basically taken back uh, their community against this trespass. And that was the end of DuPont in Goa. Um, they never came back. And when they tried to go to set up shop in, in uh, outside of Madras, the people in Goa and Bhopal alerted the organizers in in Tamil Nadu, that state, said, don't let this company in here. And so at the end of the day, DuPont wound up going to China. 
and they were able to set up in China because it was really hard to have community level um, opposition um, and protest because it's such a repressive government. Uh, but it was, I mean, that, I, I didn't expect that to happen when I was in India. I was going to take a break. Um, but that campaign inspired me so much that, you know, the power of people to, even when they have no resources or money, but they have the passion to defend their families, defend their land, defend their community's health um, against the largest corporations in the world. It was so inspiring. It just gave me a lot of uh, inspiration to come back and and to kind of re reignite my interest in my engagement in in the movement in the United States. So we meet at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, which was being run by a very visionary friend of ours named Charles Halpern. Uh, and he was convening us around some subject, or it was probably contemplative practice or something, right? That, it was yeah. the integra integration between contemplative practice and social activism. Right. And I meet you, and there was something about you. I just wanted to get to know you. So my memory is we started having some meetings, at, uh, and I remember one at a little... Uh, uh, coffee shop right next to the Beacon Hotel. And we're sitting at night in this little bare sort of cafeteria uh, space. And we're talking and you say to me, we're living in biblical times, Michael. We're living in biblical times. And I think we both had a, a, a sense that we were living in biblical times and that it was biblical because uh, of this immense threat to the environment that we were living in. And we began to try to figure out how could we uh, rejuvenate or renew the effort to stop chemical contamination and other threats to the country and the world. Yeah. Um, and and there, you know, even though the national toxins campaign had ceased to exist, the movement continued to grow. Many different environmental justice groups had come together around a, a platform, Principles of Environmental Justice, which began to link justice issues with environmental health and democracy issues and human rights. So the movement was growing. Um, there, uh, But there was also, it was an inflection point. Um, because uh, what also happened at that time was that Pete Myers and Theo Colburn, Diane Dumanowski had come out with a book called Our Stolen Future. And that book was saying, was documenting how the way that we've been thinking about chemicals and health was, was outdated in that there, the idea that there was a safe level of exposure, especially for the first thousand days of life, was uh, was faulty. And that is that toxic chemicals uh, in the womb and in the first few years of a child's life could turn on and turn off genes during critical windows of development and have profound impacts for the development of that person. And so there really was no safe dose. And they also said, look, we're, you know, the way we've evaluated chemicals is one at a time. What does that one chemical do to us, to a person, uh, an adult, in fact, um, and might cause cancer? Um, and what uh, Dr. Myers and Colburn were saying, we're actually supposed to a whole soup of chemicals. All at the same time, we have no idea what all the interactions of those chemicals are on our bodies and bodies of our families. And so it was this profound recognition of this chemical trespass that was happening against us, against the environment, and, uh, that had started with Rachel Carson's awareness a couple of decades before. And so the, the, the thing that was so important, the realization was that, A, our whole understanding was going to shift. The regulations needed to shift. The way that we thought about exposure and who was most vulnerable needed to shift. And at that time, the movement, the environmental health and justice movement, was very focused at the waste end of this problem, the incinerators and the dumps 
and fighting back against you know the this toxic economy that was looking for places to dump its waste and there was this broad recognition that if we stay at that waste end the end of the pipe we're never going to change this economy we're always going to be fighting this dump that incinerator as they move from place to place country to country it was going to be like that and so we recognized we had to move upstream we had to we had to partner with other sectors of the economy that didn't have an inherent commitment and interest and business model to to be using toxic chemicals and so it was a really important realization and the other thing that happened was that the two poster child chemicals that were we were learning about around this endocrine disruption in the early stages of life one was dioxin and the other was mercury and dioxin produced um, from uh, is, is made, it's not intentional, but it's it's the byproduct of producing either pesticides or plastics with chlorine, like PVC uh, plastics or chlorinated pesticides. And then again, when you burn them at the end of life, created dioxin. And then mercury, we know about mercury, it's a neurotoxin um, and especially damaging for kids' brains. And at the time there was Kids were being born with dioxin and mercury in their bodies, being pre-polluted before life. And at the very same time that that science was, was coming to us, we were learning about that, the Environmental Protection Agency said, medical waste incinerators are the largest source of dioxin emissions in the United States and a significant source of mercury. And so we had some meetings, as you'll remember, at Commonweal, where we brought different constituencies together, breast cancer activists, endometriosis association, religious leaders, environmental justice folks, environmental health academics, and said, look, here's this new science. And people said, wait a second, the healthcare sector, really? They're the largest polluter of dioxin? And we said, what, what hope do we have, truly? What hope do we have? to turn this toxic tide around, if the very sector of our economy that's committed to healing people, that follows the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, if that very sector is so ignorant that they're poisoning people in service of treating them. And so the the, the idea, the, the imperative to, to take on or address this in the healthcare sector was born in that room in Commonweal. And that was the beginning of healthcare without harm. And that was the beginning of healthcare without harm. And tell us what healthcare without harm is today. Well, the goal of it has always been to 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 bring environmental health and justice to this sector, to this healing sector, um, and to get them to to uh, model the transformation away from a, a fossil fuel and toxic chemical economy to anchor the resilience of communities in extreme weather and extreme trauma, uh, and, to, and to educate and mobilize health professionals as advocates, as messengers for policies and, and helping people understand that, that fossil fuels and toxic chemicals are the greatest threat to people's health on the planet, and that we need to transform away from them to support the health of everybody on the planet. In other words, you can have healthy people on a sick planet, and healthcare needs to be that leveraged sector that shows the way forward, away from that addiction, that addiction to toxic chemicals, fossil fuels, and industrial pesticides. So what are the, if you're just describing the development of healthcare without harm from that founding moment at Commonweal, and, and uh, and Commonweal uh, stayed very involved for a long time in its um, evolution. And it's one of the, uh, how, what can I say, it's one of the great moments in Commonweal's 48-year history was founding of, of that and uh, supporting you and Charlotte Brody and all the others who built it and than your ongoing leadership of it till today, but give people a sense of the scope and structure of it today. Well, it, it's evolved, it's evolved a lot. Um, 
Uh, but I'll say, you know, when we started, we didn't really have the intention of building this long-term mm-hmm. effort. We, our, our sense was that if we needed, that we needed to, to, to take on the chemical industry. And so if the healthcare sector could be a leverage, a powerful sector in opposition to that, on, at least on the side of community, that would be important. And so we, when we started, there were 4,500 medical waste incinerators in the United States. So many, many, many of most of the hospitals had incinerators. They might be having air, asthma awareness programs at the same time, but they'd have incinerators that were spewing chemicals onto their neighbors. Um, and uh, mercury was the gold standard in thermometers and blood pressure devices. And so we we took on incineration and mercury. It was your suggestion to take on mercury, in fact. Um, and so after a decade, uh, we had closed all but 100 incinerators in the United States. And we had eliminated the market for mercury in the United States by getting partnerships with the American Hospital Association, getting uh, through advocacy and, and shareholder advocacy, getting all the pharmacy chains to stop selling mercury thermometers. Um, and so we had huge victories early on. Um, and we realized, though, that these pollutants are global pollutants. So if we shut down thousands of incinerators in the United States, but they build thousands more in India and China, we're all still being polluted because these, these chemicals float on airwaves and water. Same with mercury, global pollutants. So, you, so from the very beginning, we needed a global campaign. And so we early on started work in these other places. Um, we set up, uh, you know, to eliminate mercury from one hospital in Manila, one hospital in Buenos Aires, started working in Europe, and then grew and built. And um, and through that process, um, after we won a global treaty in, in 2013, phasing mercury out of healthcare through the Minamata Convention, but through that network around these issues, early issues, mercury in particular, um, it was the messenger in the way that mercury, the mercury god, was the messenger for the, the the Roman gods. Mercury was the messenger for environmental health for the healthcare sector and say, look, we can do this. We can actually eliminate some product or some process that is ubiquitous. We can actually make that transformation. And so people said, you can't close this down. You've got to keep going. What's the next thing we can work on together? And we said, well, what about the buildings? The buildings are on life support system. They're on healthy places for the workers and for the patients. You've got fluorescent lights. There's no natural light. How do people heal in these places? There's toxic chemicals in the building materials and the furnishings and in the flooring. Nurses have some of the highest asthma rates in the country. Develop a framework around green and healthy building. And so we did. It was called the Green Guide for Healthcare, it modeled the lead uh, standard and said for every point, for every intervention, what's the health dimension of that? Because lead didn't have that. It was about energy efficiency. So it didn't, we brought health, environmental health into the building standard. And then we said, well, what about the food? You're serving food that's actually contributing to the epidemic of chronic diseases that you're treating, heart disease, cancer, obesity, stroke, serving fast food and sugar sweetened beverages. So let's change the food so that you're actually modeling what a healthy food environment should be. Um, And more than that, you're buying food from more local, regional, racially diverse, sustainable growers. You're leveraging your purchasing power. So there was a whole food dimension. Um, And we took on the plastics. We said, well, some of these plastics like PVC, they leach chemicals into patients. They leach toxic chemicals into patients as they're being treated. How insane can we be, right? And so we just took on, every time we scratched, we saw, oh my God, they represent all of the, the healthcare sector represents all the contradictions of an economy based on fossil fuels, toxic chemicals, and industrial agriculture. How do we, how do we transform it? And through all of that work, um, we built this enormous ecosystem around the world. We're now in the United States, um, 1,700 hospitals are members. So a third, almost a third of all the hospitals in the country are members of the network all on this journey. Um, we've got partners in 82 countries and partnerships with the World Health Organization, the United Nations Development Program, 
Global Environmental Facility, UNFCCC, and uh, and and uh, organizations that we've created in Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and strategic partners in India and China and South Africa and Brazil. And so we've just early on, we said, you know what? We're not going to build this monolithic organization with, you know, with a building that has our name on it. We're going to build a network and an ecosystem of, of collaborators and they can do work in their own name. We don't care. But be on that journey with us. Help transform this entire sector to to reform, to to transform the mission of healthcare in the 21st century. To be not about just treating sick people, but about supporting healing in a broader way, healing of individuals, healing of communities, and healing of the planet. I mean, that's the DNA of 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 Commonweal. We've taken our inspiration from Commonweal and all of the things that you've created there as well. And in that same moment, going back to the book by uh, Pete Myers and Theo Coburn and Diane Dumanowski, um, Our Stolen Future, um, just shortly before that, um, one of the alumni of the Commonweal Cancer Health Program, we just finished our 220th week-long retreat uh, in the last uh, 38 wow. years of the Cancer Health Program. Again, extraordinary experience. Um, one of them, Jennifer Altman, had recently died and left a small foundation in my care. And I'd never had a foundation to work with before. It was a daunting thing. Uh, but a friend of ours, Catherine Porter, was... Um, running uh, the consultative group on biodiversity, which was a group of funders concerned with biodiversity. And she was holding a meeting, and I think it was Travis City, Michigan. And uh, so I decided to go, she invited me, I decided with my new funder hat on, as well as running Commonweal, to go to this meeting in Travis City. And there was Pete Myers. Uh, The book had not yet come out. But he was talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Beto Badal from Marisla Foundation and I were both there. And and he was fairly new to philanthropy also and was trying to figure out what to do. And uh, we heard Pete talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we'd never heard about before. You know, as you said, that these incredibly minute amounts of these uh, gender benders, endocrine disrupting chemicals could shift, as you said, during gestation and early life, the whole trajectory of life. And we thought that's crazy. And and so one of our first grants was to do uh, publicity and communication for Our Stolen Future when it came out. And that was sort of my entry point, um, uh, uh, which I think was after you and I met in New York, but I can't for sure. Um, And so what began to happen were two simultaneous things. One was that you and Charlotte and many others were thinking about how we're not just going to do healthcare. As you said, we want to organize in all the sectors, the industrial sectors that don't have an interest in polluting us all with chemicals. And we want to organize at the grassroots level. We want to organize at the state level, the national level, the international level. We want to organize in all these different sectors. And then we want to use all these different tools from, uh, you know, from uh, shifting the sector itself the the legislation, litigation, you know, media, so on and so forth. And so, Gary, what you began to do was to come to meetings. I remember one in Tarrytown, New York, and you'd put up these big poster board sheets and you would diagram the whole system, right? Yeah. And I think you made a unique contribution in your ability to help us visualize the whole system uh, of which healthcare without harm was one, 
but there were so many others, right? So yeah. give us, I mean, what comes to my mind right away is healthy building network, military toxics. Give us yeah. a list of, of some of the key organizations and or just speak to that question. How how could you help us think about uh, the development and evolution of the modern environmental health and justice movement? Yeah, well, that's a big topic, isn't it? Well, it is a big topic, but that's why we're here. Oh, we got it. Um, well, so uh, in the same way, we said, okay, we're going to transform the healthcare sector to to be a model for this transformation to a more sustainable, healthy society, and, and embed health and justice into its DNA. Right, mm -hmm. that's kind of a core thing. It's like if we're going to have a moral economy, if we're going to have an economy that actually works on the planet, it's got to embed health and it's got to embed justice and equity said so we said okay we'll work on healthcare without harm that's 15 percent of the u.s economy now 20 percent of the u.s economy 10 percent globally as we got into the building sector well let's let's have another entity that does the same thing in the building sector so we helped to start the healthy building network and bill walsh came to help run it um and common uh, you know and um jennifer altman was one of the early funders as well as the Mitch Kapoor Foundation, that was another partner in this effort. And then we, we, as we were learning about these chemicals, these called phthalates that were leaching out of, out of IV bags into patients, we found uh, out that in fact, they were in cosmetics in a big way. And so we helped to launch the Safe Cosmetics Campaign with the Environmental Working Group and other organizations. So then there was the cosmetics you know, sort of strategy. It was a healthy building strategy. And then we also recognized that um, we needed to play at the international level, um, not just in healthcare, but broadly in the policy realm. And so uh, the Swedish government and others were pushing for a, a global treaty to start phasing out some of these chemicals that are long lived, persistent organic chemicals, many of them endocrine disruptors. And so we built a uh, a network called the International POPs Elimination Network that got involved in this treaty and then has now grown to include partners in 80, 90 countries. And then there was this other wing, which was, okay, so if we stopped all these incinerators in the United States, but then they're all happening around the world, we need to stop them around the world. And we created the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives to work on this kind of recycling economy and alternative materials economy. And so Gaia now is this huge network around the world as well. Um, so we started to basically kind of weave together some architecture of what has become a very robust global movement. In the meantime, um, we started, um, you'll remember that uh, Bill Moyers had done a special that the Marissa Foundation had funded called Trade Secrets. And it was sort of looking behind the scenes of the chemical industry and see all the ways in which they had used disinformation campaigns and, and attacked uh, scientists and, and, and uh, polluted regulation and democracy in the same way that they polluted our bodies. And so we said, let's use this, this, this documentary that's gonna be on PBS as a launch pad to sort of bring lots of different dimensions of the of the movement together in the United States. And so there were, I don't know, 120 different viewing parties that Judy Robinson organized um, through my organization. And that led to the birth of Coming Clean, which became a vehicle to then unite some of the key environmental justice pieces of the movement with the more white-led environmental health movements and to sort of bridge local to state to national. And that organization now is 21 years old and is a really powerful vehicle for that integrative connective tissue of doing work together that embeds health and justice in, in policy and struggle. So there's just been this whole, yeah, I mean, just build this whole set of networks and ecosystem together that forms quite a powerful movement now globally where uh people are aware of each other's campaigns all over the world and uh we're able to to visualize how to transform global markets how to win policy there's a plastics treaty now 
running through the United Nations Environmental Program. There's organizations all over the world that are engaged in that. And that 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 ecosystem has been stuff that we've all built together over the last 25 years. And the, the conversation has changed fundamentally from where do we dump all these toxic chemicals? Do we burn them in these black neighborhoods over here? These Latino neighborhoods are dumping in the native land over there. That conversation about being at the, the waste end of this issue, at the end of the pipe, has been totally transformed in our lives, where we're now we're talking about fundamentally transforming the global economy away from fossil fuels and all the derivatives of toxic chemicals and pesticides. So in our lifetime, there's been a fundamental shift, not only in the movement, but in government policy, in people's minds, like the, the greatest public health intervention we can make on the planet is phasing out fossil fuels. That's a powerful, powerful recognition. And then going back again, fairly early in this, um, as I began to understand environmental health and justice, I mean, one thing we did was to rebrand toxics campaigns as environmental health and justice, which was pretty fundamental uh, because it was more inclusive than just toxics. I mean, example, perfect example is that uh, you, that we started Healthcare Without Harm with a focus on toxics, and you saw the importance of including climate and were able to, you know, in, move deeply into that as a core dimension of healthcare without harm. But environmental health and justice was simply a broader frame, more inclusive frame than a, a toxics campaign. So, and yeah, because it allowed people to, and, and this was something that happened at Commonwealth, those people who had breast cancer understood that there was links between breast cancer and chemicals, P kids that had learning disabilities, there yeah. were links between learning disabilities. So it, it allowed us to sort of build a movement among what you used to call the disease tribes, people right. that had specific diseases that didn't understand that there was a chemical or fossil fuel related uh, origin or connecting connection to that disease. So it allowed a much broader movement to be built. Right. And and that 20, over 25 years ago, we just celebrated the 25th anniversary. Uh, uh, we started at Commonweal and San Francisco Medical Society, the Collaborative on Health and the Environment, which was precisely to bring the disease tribes to the table. Um, and also, therefore, going back to the early days, of the Jennifer Altman Foundation, as we were building out the ecosystem you described, we realized you need the supply chain, you need the funders. And yeah. so at that point, there was grant makers in health on the one hand, making health grants and uh, environmental grant makers and the consultative group on biodiversity, which is now called the Biodiversity uh, Funders Group. Uh, those were, there was health and there was environment, but nobody was strategically funding at the interface where people care about the environment, which is where it affects their health. Yeah. And so a group of us came together, uh, 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 Pete Myers, Beta Badolf, uh, uh, me and, and quite a few other colleagues, uh, actually about a dozen at the start, and uh, proposed creating the Health and Environmental Funders Network. And so what we began to do and Kathy Sessions uh, took over the Health and Environmental Funders Network, who was just brilliant with it. And what we began to do was to do campaigns where we brought together representatives of the funders and representatives of the leadership of the campaigns and tried to create like a menu of this is what the campaign needs. This is what funders are interested in. How can we match them? And how can we create a collaborative spirit between funders and grantees where the leadership of the campaign is saying to the funders, 
not only are you going to try to hold your grantees accountable, but we are going to hold our partners accountable because if they mess up a key assignment here, it's not going to work, right? And so there was actually, for a period of time at least, a a period where there was a robust relationship between funder and campaign representatives uh, working together to fund these different pieces as skillfully as we could. And I'm not saying it was nirvana or that it lasted forever, but I am saying that at least for a period of time and a very critical period of time, that actually worked reasonably well. I thought it was it was an early and healthy effort around sort of trust-based philanthropy and collaborative exactly. philanthropy where uh, it, the, the kind of corrosive power dynamic in philanthropy where the philanthropists are holding the money and they believe they know more than people who are doing the work on the ground was was changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there was a sense like, okay, these are the assets we bring to the party. And the, the advocates and said, well, here are the assets we bring to the party. Let's figure out what we can do together. And let's share an analysis together. Um, and that was, I think at that time, it was pretty new, you know. Um, there's still the tendency um, in some of philanthropy to to treat the, the community organizations and the NGOs as hired help. Mm-hmm. You know, from the you know the board meetings where the philanthropists get together and they cook up the strategy, and then they say, "Oh, let's hire some of these NGOs to sort of implement it." There's still that present, but I think there's a lot of movement also toward this more partnership model, collaborative model, understanding that people uh, in their communities know what they need. You know, and the people that are deep in these in this work know what needs to happen, and they need philanthropy to join them in a partnership way we're still in that we're still on that journey together absolutely i mean there continue to be as funder driven projects and um and uh ngo driven projects and as you say that's actually a big philosophical divide uh and at the same time there was a a set of developments in the grant maker community when we started, there were a variety of grant makers who um, who really um, were open to and got this idea of of collaboration. Uh, but at the same time, as you're saying, <clears throat> there were qu- quite a number of major funders who decided they knew best and and did these funder driven campaigns and the fact that a number of the big funder driven campaigns actually did active harm to the sectors that they were working in caused some of those big funders to rethink the funder driven model but then there were a series of very important developments on the funder side uh one of which was the emergence of what were called the conversion foundations where a bunch of uh, a public um, healthcare systems wanted to go private, and in order to get permission to go private, they had to create these very large uh, foundations. And mm-hmm. so, the conversion foundations entered the field at a time at which justice, environmental justice issues, were bigger and bigger. And so, they hired diverse staff who were committed to diversity and justice, and they became a whole new, very important dimension of the funder community. And then after that happened, the the tech sector began to emerge. And so then there was a whole new set of players, most of whom uh, had a very entrepreneurial approach, because they had created the fortunes. They were first generation uh, people creating fortunes. And again, quite a few of them had an idea that they were going to revolutionize philanthropy uh, with varying degrees of skill and varying degrees of uh, 
experience. So there have yeah. been a series of revolutions in the philanthropic sector at the same time that there's been this continuing evolution of the global environmental health and justice movement. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you, you, you characterized it well. And, you know, when I think I... Um, one of those one of those uh, tech leaders was Jeff Skoll, created the Skoll Foundation. Um, he was the, one of the founders of eBay, and his original thought was, "I was an individual. I made a fortune. I transformed, you know, commerce. It's the individual. I'm going to fund good people doing good work." And so, is this kind of social entrepreneur as kind of the lone hero? And so he funded Lone Heroes. Who, you know, who scaled mountain upon mountain to save a part of the world. And then a lot of those people transitioned out of the organization. It's like, oh, maybe we need to fund the organization. So the organization became the locus. And those organizations come and go, as we know. And so then it was like, oh, wait, it's the networks that those organizations, it's the ecosystem that organization builds. These are things that we were on a long time ago, right? And that was the ecosystem and and in that space. Um, and then they, you know, zoomed out again. It's like, no, it's actually the movement we're trying to build. And the movement is across different sectors. And so I think the emerging truth here uh, of what we've seen in our lifetime during the course of this work is that we're building the, the largest global social movement in the history of the planet. And that movement is integrating environment and health and democracy and women's rights and the rights of the free press and the rights of children. And all of these things are coming together um, on the planet. And the sort of integrative thinking that's happening um, is a very powerful thing um, and a recognition that we need to do a lot of healing in a lot of places. There's a lot of uh, a lot of community healing. There's a lot of intergenerational healing from all the racism and colonialism that we still live with. And then there's this collective trauma in which uh, COVID was a, was a, a, an early example of, and climate, the climate crisis is, is that collective trauma. And so another dimension of all this work we're talking about, which is very core to Commonweal, is what's the spiritual dimensions of this transformation. It's not just a technological fix. It's not like, oh, if we put enough solar panels on enough clinics around the world or houses, we're gonna solve this problem. It's not that, um, although it's crucial. How do we transform consciousness? And I think two of the powerful ideas that, that you've embodied and Commonwealth has embodied, and I've learned a lot from, is the idea of that we are all interconnected. There's interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh said. We're connected to all beings. And so when we harm one part of that, that being, we harm ourselves. So that sense of, of interconnection of everybody on the planet and all beings is one of those core concepts. And the other is, which emerges from that is compassion. If we're connected to everybody, if somebody's suffering in Bhopal or in a mine for cobalt in Congo or in Louisiana or a breast cancer survivor, we are connected to those people and we need to build compassion. We need to find the compassion in ourselves to, to embrace that. And so we need to build a global economy on those two principles. First, I agree deeply. Uh, and those questions have been core to our work and core to people all over the world. Um, at a certain point, just following the logic that you just described of the interconnectedness of all these issues, as you know, I began to talk about and think about the global poly crisis. And I remember coming to a meeting of, I think it was the uh, Health and Environmental Funders Network, where you and uh, our, our 
dear colleague Ruth Hennig, uh, both were there, you and Ruth, uh, who was at the John Merck Fund and did such incredible work, one of the most brilliant funder strategists we've had in that period. But at the end, and I was made a, did a little talk about the global poly crisis. And I remember you and Ruth both came up to me afterward and you said, uh, it's just seared in my memory because I trusted you both so much. And you said, Michael, I don't see how you're going to move the needle on this. And um, so Pete Myers and I and others have worked on it for 10 years. And I thought it was going to be a really long, long slog before anybody would begin to think about the global poly crisis. And all of a sudden, last year, it went as a meme, it went global, right? Yeah. And so, again, going back to what you were describing before of the interconnectedness of everything, you know, the sort of elevator speech that we had about it is that a whole set of environmental, social, technological, financial, economic, political, and other stressors are interacting with increasing force and velocity, creating completely unpredictable future shocks that uh, that hit us with more and more power, and that there is no simple solution to this. We can't create a single agenda that's mm -hmm. going to get it, uh, us out of this but we must figure out how to navigate it, that this is a bottleneck in human and biological evolution, that we know, an article I actually wrote at the beginning of this thing, the age of extinctions and the emerging environmental health movement, and I suggested it would be led in large part by women and so on. So that line of my thinking led to the thinking about the poly crisis as others were led in other ways. But here we are, Gary, we've, you know, devoted whatever, 30, 40, depending on how you count, 50 years or more just since we began working to this immense effort on environmental health and justice to say nothing of all the other sectors that you described. And guess what? The planet continues to get more polluted, right? For all our, for all the battles we won, we're losing the war, right? At least as far as I'm concerned. And so, no, in well, I'm not sure, but go on. All right, I'll I'll make the case, uh, and I'd love to hear you say we're winning the war. But I, I think the movement, the global movement that you're describing, the greatest in human history, is real. Uh, but the parameters, the physical parameters of the biological basis of life on Earth continue to be weakened. And here we are, you know, in terms of consciousness, of the poly crisis, climate, the climate emergency was the first indicator. The, I'm talking about not all the complexity of it, but mm -hmm. in the public mind, the climate thing was first, then came COVID, and then came the Russian Ukraine war. And it was those three in rapid succession. And of course, there were a hundred other things that deserve to be listed at the same time. Um, but the awareness of the poly crisis and the emergence, just as the environmental health and justice uh, field emerged, so the field of poly crisis research and study has emerged, you know, yeah. as kind of a, to me, it's environmental health and justice on steroids. It's just like an even greater statement of environmental health and justice. Yeah. But I want to hear you tell me that we're winning the war. Well, I would say a few things that are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. One is that, for example, if 
there's more renewable energy being installed on this in this country and on the planet than fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. the, as you say, things are accelerating. So the acceleration of of more sustainable technologies to provide energy to us, to provide run our cars, transportation, that is accelerating. That is happening in an incredible speed. And it's not just a movement doing that. It's this is where the investment is going. Mm -hmm. You know, the investment is not in coal. There's still way too much investment in fossil fuels, which the banks are still running with. And it's that needs to be stopped. They need to be stopped. They need to be held accountable. So I think we need to starve the fossil fuel industry because not only is it polluting the planet through uh, climate, the major driver of climate, but just the air pollution from the fossil fuels is killing more people, twice as many people as AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. That's environmental health on steroids. Millions and millions of people dying from the burning of fossil fuels. That doesn't even address the climate issue, just the pollution of that. And on top of that, they polluted a democracy. They polluted uh, the regulatory system. So how is it that that the whole Republican Party in this country is against climate change, when even in many of the two thirds of all the renewable energy and green green energy uh, investments are in red states. These politicians are working against the interests of their own state because they're captured by the money and power of the fossil fuel industry. So I see, sure, there's lots of interest, mining interests and forests and all, but in terms of where the center power is on the planet in the corporate sector, it's in the fossil fuel industry. And so that's the heart of the wound. And it would open up, weeping them would open up the space for just a fundamental speed of transformation around democracy, around health, around technology. And so that's where I'm focusing. At the same time, this industry, I think, is quite comfortable with fascism, with authoritarianism. In fact, it does better with authoritarianism than it does in democracy because democratic governments say, hey, what doesn't make sense for us to continue to invest in this when we can create more jobs that are healthier in green chemistry, renewable energy, and sustainable agriculture? Why are we doing this? So they do better in places like Russia and China under, under authoritarian governments in India or the United States or elsewhere. And so I think that there's these two forces. There's this global movement around global survival and democracy and rights and there's this very powerful movement toward fascism, fossil fuel fascism. The jury's out, but I'm going to go with the movement around global survival. And I think that ultimately there will be many, many losses. There'll be many species that go extinct. There'll be many, many people who die and lose their homes that are burned out and flooded out. But I think that ultimately that will prevail. That movement will prevail. Humanity will go on, and they'll and we will have, ha, we have we will have gone through a very very biblical trauma together. But my hope is that will transform consciousness. Let's just go quiet for a moment with that. Peace, peace. You know, Gary, I have to say this is a powerful moment for me. Um, so interesting. It just takes me back to when I met you. And uh, oh, I, I love what you're saying. I mean, I, I have my own hope for the future. Um, I mean, you know, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Václav Havel, the great Czech playwright and statesman, about the difference between optimism and hope. And he says, you know, optimism is the belief that everything will go right. He said, hope, by contrast, 
is a deep orientation of the human soul that can be held in the darkest of times, you know. And as you know, I've been spent the last 40 years of my life working with people with cancer, most of them with very life-threatening cancers. And, and it's very difficult for them to be optimistic. But it's important uh, for them to find hope in whatever form it can. And, you know, there's this, again, this core, mm, core awareness that I have that a wound is not just a wound, but it's an opening. Uh, and what Dame Edith Sitwell said about the poet William Blake, she said, he was cracked, but it was through the crack that the light came, right? And so the wound as an opening to the light. And so this immense planetary wound that we are experiencing this great age of extinctions that we are going through, this bottleneck in human and biological evolution. Um, the hope is that as with individual healing, that we can consciously engage with the planetary wound to allow the light to come through uh, to do precisely what you said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't given up on that either. Uh, but um, so it's just really important. But I, I have to say, to put it differently, the, the scope of the challenge is pretty overwhelming. Let me just put it that way. And, and um, I think, I mean, another way to say it is, I agree with you that humanity is a weedy species and we will likely survive this immense age of extinctions. The question is, aside from how much of biological creation will be left along with how much of humanity, what kind of humanity will survive? Will it be a fascist, a techno-fascist world of enhanced human beings that look down on old type human beings and just use them like lab animals or whatever? Or will it be a world of uh, peace and consciousness and justice and, you know, what we've spent our lives fighting for? And that seems to me at a certain level, and it's very congruent with what you just said, to be the question, are we headed for fossil fuel techno-fascism, or are we headed uh, toward a world where at immense cost, I, I mean, a true holocaust of life, you know, at yeah. immense cost that we have learned how to become a mature planetary civilization uh, uh, and rebuild a, a, a biologically and spiritually rich world. And that's the issue, right? Mm. And yeah. it's the question of our stance in that. Okay, so you what? and I are. You, it's our stance. How do we? How do you hold that? Yeah. How do you hold that? Right. And so, uh, I just think if we see ourselves as coming from standing in this in this river of justice and consciousness and and building off of all the things we've taken from our ancestors and all the things that we're passing on to our descendants, and that we just show up in a way with hope and with our hearts and with our best intentions and not be attached to the outcomes, to the results. We bring all of who we are to that presence, that moment, and bring others along with us. That's, that's what we can do and hope that the next generation continues to take up that mantle, continues to evolve um, consciousness on the planet, economies on the planet, 
healing on the planet. You and I are at the at the twilight of our lives, and so uh, I think it's good to feel good about what we've done and what we've helped to build and create and spawn, and it'll be taken on by others going forward. Wow, beautiful! I didn't. I knew we were going to have an extraordinary conversation. I didn't. I didn't expect that you would reignite the parts of me that hope. Um, because there are other parts of me that are just so aware of of the odds against what we hope for, you know. I think what we're both saying in different ways, but you've been, I mean, it's been very inspiring to talk with you. We're talking about how in the midst of this Holocaust of life on earth, where so many people are just um, in despair, eco-grief, despair, whatever, mm -hmm. how do we hold hope? What are the sources of hope? What are the sources of engagement? What are the sources of continuing the struggle and the fight? You know, and as you said, show up, the, you know, Angelus Arian's great laws for the principles of uh, spiritual life. Show up, tell the truth, and don't be attached to the outcome. You know, be present. I'm missing one of them. Um, that's, is it be kind? No, that was it. Yeah. I like that one. Well, kindness is, as a friend of mine says, kindness is love with its work boots on, you know, so, yeah. Well, beautiful, Gary. So as we come to a close here, what have we not said to each other that we'd like to say? I love you, Michael. Mm. I love you, Gary. You know, you've been such an important person in my life, and it brings tears to my eyes. And uh, just to both be alive and present, and yeah. neither of us have stopped working, right? You know? No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there. It's the, the interesting thing is we still have something to offer, you know? As elders in particular. Yeah. You know, elders. Yeah. Um, and it's inspiration to others. Yeah. Yeah. You have you have a whole cadre of people in the common wheel ecosystem who are being inspired by you. And uh and so that's a lovely place to be. Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you, Gary Cohen, for being with us at the new school. Thank you for your friendship, your partnership. And um I didn't expect to be so profoundly moved and inspired. I expected we would do a beautiful exploration of how we experience the uh, global environmental health and justice movement, but I didn't expect this infusion of love and hope. And you know, it's such a beautiful thing. How does it go? Uh, it's loving someone gives you courage, being loved gives you hope, or maybe it's the reverse, I can't remember. But it's just this profound friendship and how, you know, the ancients felt that friendship was the deepest source of human connection. And I just feel our love for each other. And I feel the courage and hope that talking to you gives me. It's Fantastic. quite remarkable. It's a transformative moment captured on a Zoom call. What can I say? Onward <laughs> <laughs> together. Don't take it don't 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 take it don't 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 take it don't 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 take it 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 don't 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 Oh, no.
knows 